Open your Bibles, as I said, to Romans chapter 16. But before we read the passage, one of the greatest preachers in America has passed away. My dear friend, Dr. Greg Dixon, former pastor of the Indianapolis Baptist Temple in Indianapolis, Indiana. In Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4, look at what Paul writes. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life who have for my life laid down their own necks. Who have for my life laid down their own necks. This man and his wife, Priscilla and Aquila. Then Paul says, unto whom Not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Unto whom I give thanks. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, Aquila. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me read verses 8 through 11. We would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us, Notice, by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. By the means of many persons, thanks may be given. Unto whom I give thanks. By the means of many persons, thanks may be given. One more passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Paul was not remiss to thank the people that deserved his thanks. We live in a generation of people who have such a dearth of character and integrity that even common courtesies are almost not existent in today's society. Common courtesies are extremely uncommon among this generation. 
There are three phrases, and I've, I've said this several times, and if I live, I will say it several times again. There are three things that we should be in the habit of saying. It should be easy for us to say. It should be always on our hearts to say it. There are three things that we should always remember to say. Three things that proud, arrogant, conceited people hardly ever say. I love you. I'm sorry. Thank you. I love you. I'm sorry. Thank you. To people of character and integrity, those three statements are easily said when appropriate. The proud, arrogant, and conceited will rarely say any of the above because of the pride of their hearts. Thank you is one of those three phrases that we just cannot say enough and often don't say enough. Paul gave thanks to the people that helped him, the people that risked their lives for him, the people that stood by him, the people that prayed for him, the people that suffered with him. He gave thanks. On this Thanksgiving weekend, I want to give thanks to Greg Dixon and all of the courageous, uncompromising preachers in this country who for the most part preach without thanks. Those of you that have been under my preaching for any length of time have heard me talk about the great preachers of colonial America. Without the pulpits and the preachers of colonial America, there would have been no Lexington Green, no Concord Bridge. There would have been no Bunker Hill. There would have been no Declaration of Independence. There would have been no war for independence. There would have been no Constitution, no Bill of Rights. There would have been no independent sovereign nation known as the United States of America. Without the preaching of the colonial preachers of New England, this country would not exist. If the preachers of colonial America were like the preachers of America today, this country would not exist. For those of you that have heard these names before, let me reiterate, for those of you that may be new to this history, this is something you need to know. James Caldwell was a Presbyterian minister at the time that the American Revolution broke out. James Caldwell was called the rebel high priest and the fighting chaplain. He is most known for the Give em Watts story. Very briefly, during the Springfield, that would be in New Jersey, engagement, the colonial militia ran out of wadding for their muskets. Quickly, Caldwell galloped to his Presbyterian church and returned with an armload of hymnals. He threw them to the ground and he hollered to the militiamen, 
Now, boys, give them Watts, meaning Isaac Watts, the famous songwriter who compiled many of the songs that were in the hymn books. They would use the pages of those hymns for wadding for their muskets. The British hated Caldwell so much. They murdered his wife, Hannah, in her own home as she sat with her children on her bed. They shot her dead through a window of her home. Very similarly to the way that Lon Harucci, the FBI sniper, shot Vicki Weaver as she held her infant baby in her arms, blowing Vicki's brains all over the little baby. And our Attorney General, appointed by Donald Trump, Bill Barr, was the man most responsible for defending Lana Rucci and the other murderers at Ruby Ridge, allowing those men to go scot-free and to get by with premeditated murder. They hated Caldwell so much they murdered his wife, Hannah. Later, a fellow American was bribed by the British to assassinate Pastor Caldwell, which is exactly what he did. Americans loyal to the crown, Tories they were called, burned both Caldwell's house and his church. But today, no less than three cities and two public schools in the state of New Jersey bear his name. John Peter Muhlenberg. Muhlenberg was pastor of a Lutheran church in Woodstock, Virginia, when hostilities erupted between Great Britain and the American colonies. When news of Bunker Hill reached Virginia, Muhlenberg preached a sermon from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 to his congregation. He reminded his parishioners that there was a time to preach and a time to fight. He said that for him, the time to preach was past and it was now time to fight. He then threw off his vestments and stood before his congregants in the uniform of a Virginia colonel. Muhlenberg was later promoted to Brigadier General in the Continental Army, later to Major General. He participated in the battles of Brandywine, Germantown, Monmouth, and Yorktown. He went on to serve in both the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Jonas Clark, pastor of the Church of Lexington, Massachusetts. On April 19, 1775, when the British troops marched on Concord with orders to arrest Sam Adams and John Hancock and seize the firearms of the colonists, it was Pastor Clark's male congregants who were the first ones to face off against the British troops as they marched through Lexington. When you hear the story of the Minutemen at the Battle of Lexington, remember that the Minutemen were Pastor Jonas Clark and the men of his congregation, who died, eight of them, in the initial volley on what we call now Lexington Green, which is nothing more than the front yard of the church in which those men worshipped every Sunday. Those of you who do not know need to be aware that years ago, whenever th that day, April 19, fell on a Sunday, I preached a message word for word. I should say I preached Pastor Clark's message word for word 
from the historical record, the message that he preached on the first anniversary of the Battle of Lexington, that would be April 19, 1776. On that first anniversary, Pastor Clark preached a message called The Fate of Bloodthirsty Oppressors, subtitle, and it's God's tender care of his distressed people. And I preached that message word for word as Pastor Clark preached it on April 19, 1776. We have a DVD of that. It's over at the table. It's online. Get this message and then give it to your friends and tell them this is the kind of preaching the American people use to hear. This is the kind of preaching that America is not hearing any longer for the most part. Jonas Clark, Peter Muhlenberg, James Caldwell, and I could go on and on with the names of great patriot pastors in colonial America. Dr. Greg Dixon was of that caliber. No preacher who ever lived, no man who ever lived, was more ardent, a lover of God, a lover of freedom, and a lover of our Constitution and Bill of Rights than was Dr. Greg Dixon. I thank God that the Lord let me know him and be his friend for so many decades. Brother Dixon told me more than once, and I'm not making this up, and I don't say this for myself, I say this to show you what kind of man he was. Brother Dixon told me more than once, several times, that he was convinced that I was a direct descendant of the colonial pastor Ebenezer Baldwin. He believed that I was raised up by God as a preacher in the similitude of America's colonial pastors. He told me that on a number of occasions. I do know this. Greg Dixon was every bit the patriot pastor, as was James Caldwell or Jonas Clark or any other of the great American pastors of yesteryear. And I would not say that if I wasn't convinced it was true. I wrote this on my Facebook page a couple of days ago. With a heavy heart, I must report that my good friend, ardent patriot and courageous man of God, Dr. Greg Dixon, has passed away. He was 87. Dr. Dixon was a longtime pastor of the Indianapolis Baptist Temple in Indianapolis, Indiana. He was the pastor of IBT when President G.W. Bush and Attorney General John Ashcroft, both professing Christians, sent federal stormtroopers to seize the church buildings and all of its assets in 2001. Bush and Ashcroft hold the distinction of being the only president and attorney general in American history to ever seize a church and they were so-called Christian conservative Republicans. Most churches could have never endured what IBT endured 
under the immense pressure and persecution of America's federal government. But Dr. Dixon's son, Greg, followed him as the pastor of IBT, and the church has relocated and is stronger than ever. Without a doubt, Dr. Dixon was the preeminent leader of what is now known as the Free Church Project, a Free Church Movement, excuse me, in America. He was the man who first introduced me to the evils of the IRS 501c3 nonprofit organization status for churches. I spoke in his pulpit and he spoke in mine. We shared many wonderful hours together in public, in person, and on the phone. Besides my father, Brother Dixon had that unique balance of unlimited love and undaunted courage like no man I've ever known. I know of no one who is his equal. His passing is the loss of a giant and a giant loss for religious liberty, constitutional government, and bold, faithful preaching. Please pray for his wife, Wanda, and their family. Greg Dixon was part of the inner circle that created the moral majority and the religious right back in the late in the late 70s. But unlike many of those men, dare I say, unlike most of those men, he refused to compromise his convictions for political favor or financial gain. And his principal preaching and stand for religious liberty against the power of a godless state was unmatched in the 20th and first part of the 20th century. I'm telling you, he has no equal. Upon hearing about the deaths of King Saul and his son, David's best friend, Jonathan, David lamented, how are the mighty fallen? 2 Samuel 1.19, how are the mighty fallen? It is my opinion that David's lamentation could be spoken regarding the death of the American pulpit. How are the mighty fallen? Make no mistake about it. For the most part, thank God this is not universally true. But for the most part, the American pulpit is stone cold dead. It's dead. It has been replaced with corporate CEOs, carnival barkers, entertainment evangelists, motivational speakers, denominational hacks, and groveling statists. The Holy Scripture identifies them another way, as hirelings, ear ticklers, and wolves in sheep's clothing. Please do not misunderstand me. There are still, thank God, thousands, tens of thousands of bold, courageous, principled men of God in the pulpits of their churches of various denominations who have not been intimidated by the Internal Revenue Code they're not enamored with political correctness. 
They are fearless, courageous proclaimers of truth in their pulpits, and I thank God for every one of them. The problem is they are far and few between. In many communities, you cannot find such a man. We have people that are watching us online every Sunday that have visited every church in their community and they have not found a courageous man of God in the pulpit, a fearless truth teller in the pulpit. That's why they watch Liberty Fellowship every Sunday. Many of you in this room have moved to this little town in Northwest Montana because it was important enough for you to be part of a fellowship that embraces the truth and exposes the lies from the pulpit and from the congregation, that you were willing to pack up your family, uproot your foundation, leave your job, and come to a place in which you had never lived in order to be part of a congregation where the courageous truth of God's word is preached every Sunday from this pulpit. I thank God for you. I thank God for you. But that doesn't change the truth that for the most part, the American pulpit is dead. Stone, cold, dead. And I'm not talking about a lack of emotion. I'm not talking about how emotional the people in the congregation might be or how emotional the pastor might be. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about dead to truth. Dead to being willing to stand against any adversary to proclaim what is politically incorrect and biblically correct to the world. I'm talking about men who are not intimidated by the Internal Revenue Service. I'm talking about men that are not intimidated by their own congregations. I'm talking about men who are not in it for the dollar. I'm talking about men who are going to preach the truth if it kills them. That's what I'm talking about. Where once the American pulpit was noted as being ablaze with righteousness, that's a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous French historian that visited America shortly after our war for independence. That was his word. He said, the pulpits of America were ablaze with righteousness. It is now most famous for being awash in rigor mortis. <laughs> Do you know that almost 4,000 churches close their doors every year in this country? 4,000 every year. But you know what? If a church isn't preaching the truth courageously and fearlessly and without compromise, it's better if they close their doors. Because then at least they're not deceiving people with falsehood. <laughs> Would to God the only churches that were open were the churches that were preaching the truth. America's colonial pastors must be turning over in their graves. America's colonial pastors were the fire and the inspiration for America's break from the tyranny of the British crown. Patriot preachers such as John Witherspoon, 
John Leland, Jonathan Mayhew, Samuel Cooper, Ebenezer Baldwin, James Caldwell, John Peter Muhlenberg, and Jonas Clark were as important to the success of the American Revolution as were the Patriots, Ben Franklin, John Adams, San Adams, Dr. Joseph Warren, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and Richard Henry Lee. The pulpits and the preachers of, of colonial America were as important to our successful revolution as were the patriots whose names we know so well. Listen to how John Adams delineated the duty of America's pastors. This is John Adams. It is the duty of the clergy. It is the duty of the clergy to accommodate their discourses, their sermons, to the times, to preach against such sins as are most prevalent, Amen. and recommend such virtues as are most wanted or needed. For example, still quoting, if exorbitant ambition and venality are predominant. Oh boy, does that sound familiar? Ought they not to warn their hearers against those vices? If public spirit is much wanted or needed, should they not inculcate this great virtue? If the rights and duties of Christian magistrates and subjects are disputed, should they not explain them, show their nature, ends, limitations, and restrictions? How much soever it may move the gall of Massachusetts. Close quote. In other words, no matter how people don't like what the preacher is preaching, it is the duty of the pastor to preach it anyway. That's what John Adams said regarding the pulpits of America. It's our duty to preach against the sins that are most prevalent, including and especially the sins of the White House. It is the duty of the pulpit to explain the constitutional biblical laws of freedom to the people, to articulate the natural law principles upon which our Bill of Rights was constructed to explain the ends, the limitations, and the restrictions of government to the people so they understand the God-given rights of liberty and constitutionalism. I'm talking about the principle of constitutionalism. The importance of federalism, the checks and the balances that are built into our constitutional rule of law between the branches of government in Washington and between the state governments of the sovereign states that are independent and sovereign and who have a greater 
autonomy and liberty designated to them than is designated to the central government in Washington, D.C. It is the duty of the clergy to explain, extrapolate, and expound these great principles that God has given to us in government. The average pastor doesn't even know these principles themselves. How can they explain something they are ignorant of? The vast majority of pastors today, well, at least the evangelical ones, will shirk their duty by saying something like, I'm only called to preach the gospel. Yes, they are called to preach the gospel. How many of them are even doing that? The gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation by faith in him. How many pastors are preaching that? How many pastors are getting in their pulpits and they're telling people they must be baptized to be saved? They must speak in tongues to be saved. They must keep the golden rule to be saved. They must join the church to be saved. They must go through catechism classes to be saved. How many pastors are in the pulpits of America today who are preaching a false gospel? The gospel of the Lord Jesus is Jesus only by faith only. Minus and plus nothing. Come on. If they're not preaching that, they're not preaching the gospel. The minute they add anything to the work of Christ on the cross, the the minute they add anything to faith in Jesus Christ, they are preaching a false gospel. They say, I'm only called to preach the gospel. Yes, you are. So preach the gospel. Don't adulterate it. Don't taint it with the doctrines of men. Don't pollute it by adding works of any kind to the message of faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. Yes, we are to preach the gospel. And if you are trusting anything, if you're trusting your baptism, you're not going to heaven. If you're trusting your tongue speaking and your healing, you're not going to heaven. If you're trusting your church membership, you're not going to heaven. If you're trusting your catechism, you're not going to heaven. If you're trusting your your good works, keeping the law, keeping the Ten Commandments, you're not going to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Give me an amen. Amen. But by me. Your works cannot save you. Your church membership cannot save you. Your baptism cannot save you. Your tongues cannot save you. And if you are trusting any of that, you are not hearing the gospel. The gospel is Jesus only. By faith only. Yes, we are to preach the gospel. But we're also told by the Apostle Paul in very clear and succinct terms, preach the word. We have a duty to preach the word, we preachers. All of the word, 
Not just the gospel. All of the word. This Bible, 66 books, 1,189 chapters, and much of this Bible deals with things other than the gospel. If you took out from this Bible all of the verses that do not specifically discuss the gospel, you would have a very small Bible. This book is a book of science. It's a book of history. It's a book of mathematics. It's a workbook for families. It's a book of business. It's a book of economics. It's a book of government. To ignore what the Bible teaches on all these subjects is to make the vast majority of the scriptures completely irrelevant. And that's exactly what the modern pulpit is doing today. It is making the Bible completely irrelevant, especially to the affairs of government. In colonial America, the people look to the pastor to give them God's insight regarding the truth of government and related issues. You know where Christians are looking now to get counsel on government? They're looking to Fox News. They're looking to the media pundits. You know I'm telling you the truth. If a pastor gets up and says something that they haven't heard on Fox News, or if something that Fox News doesn't agree with, who are they going to agree? Who will the Christians in the pews listen to? Who will they take counsel from? Not from their pastor. They'll take their counsel from Sean Hannity. And if the pastor says something that Sean Hannity doesn't agree with, they'll take Sean Hannity's side and they will get angry at the pastor for not agreeing with Sean Hannity. These Fox News propagandists have replaced the pulpits of America and the Christians of America are listening to the propagandists on the media and they're not listening to their pastors and therefore they are not receiving the truth of what God has told us in his word relative to the subject of government. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe some of you are guilty of this and that's why you got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> Well, maybe I just need to bear down a little bit harder on this subject. I'm telling you, it's the truth. Well, I mean, if you listen to Sean Hannity five or six days a week, how many hours plus the other ones all week long? So you're listening to multiplied hours of propaganda. You come to church on Sunday, and if the pastor even bothers to address it, which most of them don't, and it doesn't line up with what you've heard for 20 hours during the week, who are you going to believe? Well, our pastor just doesn't fully understand everything. Like Sean does. And like Bill O'Reilly does. I'm glad to see a few of the pundits on Fox News are starting to wake up to the truth and put a question mark instead of an exclamation point behind the name of Donald Trump. I'm glad to see that. Some of them have lost their jobs over it. Now they're trying, the, 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 the Trump toadies are trying to pressure Fox News to fire Judge Andrew Napolitano because Napolitano is telling the truth about the Constitution of the United States.
But no, no, Donald Trump is above the Constitution of the United States. Thank God for Judge Napolitano. In John Adams' famous speech in support of the Declaration of Independence, which was the second most powerful speech of the Revolution, second only to Patrick Henry's give me liberty or give me death speech. John Adams said this, and those of you that are faithful at Liberty Fellowship will remember the video that we show around Independence Day of the events taking place up to the, the, the passing of the Declaration. And you remember John Adams getting up on the floor of the Congress and giving this speech. Of course, what they used was only a port, small portion of his speech. So these words will be familiar to you, but I want to read them for context purpose. Sir, before God, I believe the hour is come. My judgment approves this measure, the declaration, and my whole heart is in it. All that I have and all that I am and all that I hope in this life, I am now ready here to stake upon it. And I leave off as I begun that live or die, survive or perish, I am for the declaration. It is my living sentiment, and by the blessing of God, it shall be my dying sentiment. Independence now, and independence forever. That's the part you're familiar with. He went on to say, read this declaration at the head of the army. Every sword will be drawn from its scabbard and the solemn vow uttered to maintain it or to perish on the bed of honor. Publish it from the pulpit. Religion will approve it and the love of religious liberty will cling round it, resolve to stand with it or fall with it. Send it to the public halls. Proclaim it there. Let them hear it who heard the first roar of the enemy's cannon. Let them see it who saw their brothers and their sons fall on the field of Bunker Hill and in the streets of Lexington and Concord. And the very walls will cry out in its support. Notice he said, publish it from the pulpit. Publish it from the pulpit. And for the love of religious liberty and possessing the resolve to stand with it or fall with it, the preachers of colonial America sounded forth the clarion call for liberty from pulpits throughout New England just as Adams said they would. It sounded forth from the pulpits. I've said it before, I'll say it again, and I'll keep saying it. America's problem is not a political problem. America's problem is a pulpit problem. Get the pulpits right, and the country will be right. As I've said twice so far in this address, Greg Dixon had no equal.
as the Greg Dixons of America leave us, who will take their place? Who will be the Jonas Clark in America's 21st century? Who will be the James Caldwell in America's 21st century? Who will be the Greg Dixon in America's 21st century? What is to become of the church in the 21st century? We already see what's happened to the church over the last 50 years. Think of the next 50 years. 4,000 churches closing their doors every year in this country. Do the math. There are not nearly that many new churches beginning. Churches are corrupted, compromised, complacent. They've become nothing more than businesses. Pastors are, they're not preachers. They're CEOs. The bottom line for the churches of America today, for the most part, is not preaching the truth. It's being successful, having buildings, crowds, big offerings, programs. Think about what is the future of the church in America? Where are the future Greg Dixons? Some of you aren't going to like this. I've got to say it. Pastors and churches all over America have replaced their faith in God with faith in Donald Trump. They have prostrated their hearts before a blasphemer. They have abandoned both the Bible and the Constitution. How far have the pulpits of America sunk? Well, here's an example. A few days ago, Franklin Graham, son of the famous Billy Graham, said that anyone who opposed Donald Trump is demonic. In defending Trump, Graham said this, and this is a quote. If you look at what the president, just for our country, regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, unemployment is at the lowest in 70 years. More African Americans are working, more Latinos are working, more Asians are working, more everybody are working. We have an economy that is just screaming forward. It's incredible, close quote. He added that a strong economy means Christians have more money to support their local churches. He, preachers, like Franklin Graham, have sold their souls for power and money. All about money. All about economy. All about jobs. All about offerings for the church. Money, 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 money! What about Trump's Blasphemies against God, Mr. Graham. What about his praise for international dictators and despots? I don't think there's a dictator anywhere in the world that Donald Trump hasn't lavished with praise. 
He's even threatening to veto the resolution that passed the Senate and the House with only 11 negative votes in both chambers condemning what Communist China is doing now in Hong Kong in suppressing the freedoms of the people of Hong Kong. Both Democrats and Republicans came together and denounced the oppression of Communist China in Hong Kong. And Trump is saying, I'm going to veto that resolution. And he called the president, the dictator of China, I, I don't have the exact term, but he's a wonderful man. This is a man who controls an atheist communist system of government that has murdered millions of their own people. This is a, an atheistic system of government that right today is incarcerating thousands, maybe tens of thousands of political prisoners, torturing them beyond description. And Donald Trump lavishes the Chinese leader with accolades and praise. And he's done the same thing for dictators all over the world. There's not a dictator in the world that Donald Trump doesn't like. You know why? Because Donald Trump is a dictator in his heart. He wants to be a dictator. And if he has four more years in office, by the time he gets done, he may well indeed be America's first dictator. What about his support for Israel's apartheid and genocide? Mr. Graham, oh, you're, you're all in favor of that. What about the 110,000 bombs that Trump has dropped on innocent people around the world? Without a declaration of war from Congress, without the approbation of Congress, the consent of Congress, or the authority of Congress or the Constitution, 110 plus thousand bombs killing tens of thousands at the minimum of innocent people. I will say it straight out, Donald Trump joins Barack Obama and G.W. Bush as an international war criminal and murderer. Yeah. Speaking of war criminals, Donald Trump has pardoned two or three of the military personnel in this country who were charged and found guilty, found guilty by our U.S. military courts, found guilty of war crimes. And Trump has pardoned them. War criminals, pardoned. What about his bribes to keep prostitute quiet, prostitutes quiet, Mr. Graham? What about his efforts to enact red flag gun confiscation laws and to create a Nazi SS style pre-crime federal agency to disarm American, innocent Americans based on politically incorrect speech? You have a handout that we gave you earlier talking about the pre-crime federal Gestapo that's now being created by Attorney General William Barr and President Donald Trump. What about his pride, arrogance, bullying, sexism, racism, and greed, Mr. Graham? Money, 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 economy, jobs, money, money. Donald Trump exudes the spirit of Antichrist. 
You had Franklin Graham, Jerry Falwell Jr., Robert Jeffries et al. continue to defend him, promote him, and compromise their pulpits for him. I am not angry with Donald Trump. I am angry with the so-called men of God in America's pulpits who have compromised everything that's precious in God's word and in our Bill of Rights in order for them to sit at the seat of Trump's power and influence. Those are the ones I'm angry with. In my opinion, they are no better than the prophets of Ahab. Dr. Greg Dixon. His church in Indianapolis for many years was in the top 10 largest churches in America. As I said at the beginning of this address, Dr. Dixon was in the inner circle of the men who formed the moral majority in the so-called religious right, as was dubbed by the media, back in the late 70s. He was there. He could have joined the majority of those men and compromised his message, his convictions in order to be accepted at G.W. Bush's table of power and influence. But he didn't. the only man I've ever met in my life that I could say was as courageous as Dr. Greg Dixon was my father. Greg Dixon did not know fear except the fear of God. He was as bold as a lion it didn't matter what the opposition was, how strong it was, powerful it was, ubiquitous it was. He would not bend, much less break. At the same time, he had a heart of compassion for people like very few men I've ever seen. Instead of groveling in front of power, then it was G.W. Bush. He had the courage to tell President Bush and Attorney General John Ashcroft that they were violating not only the Constitution of the United States, but the laws of liberty by the way they were trying to regulate the churches of America. He told that to their face. And they sent the federal stormtroopers to Indianapolis and hauled him and his people out of the church on stretchers put him in jail, confiscated his church, property, and all of its assets to make an example out of Greg Dixon. You cannot defy the government of the United States in the name of religious liberty. The very principle upon which America fought its war for independence, religious liberty, now does not exist 
in the United States. When you take that 501c3 tax exempt status as a church, you immediately fall under the authority and the regulations of the IRS and the federal government. And you want to know why these preachers aren't preaching anything? It's because they love money more than they love God. They're afraid that if they don't have a tax-exempt status, therefore they won't be tax-exempt and they'll need to pay taxes and all that kind of thing. The people won't give. People won't support. And if they do, they won't have as much left over. And they won't be able to build all their buildings and have all their big giant staffs and do all these things that they think are so important for them to do. It's all about money to the average preacher. It wasn't about money to Greg Dixon. And it wasn't about power. And it wasn't about influence. And it wasn't about popularity. With Greg Dixon, it was about truth and justice and the Bible and the Bill of Rights. Hmm. He compromised no biblical conviction or constitutional principle. Never. He was willing to go to jail for his convictions, and he did. He was willing to be hated for his convictions, and he was. And he faithfully and courageously preached his convictions regardless of cost. What a man. On this Thanksgiving Day, whether you ever met him or not, whether you ever heard him preach or not, where you, whether you even heard his name mentioned until today or not. On this Thanksgiving Day, every liberty-loving Christian in America, every liberty-loving Christian in America should say, Thank you, Lord. For James Caldwell. Thank you, Lord, for Jonas Clark. Thank you, Lord, for Greg Dixon. Amen. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.